Hey everybody, welcome. It's about 10 o'clock here on Wednesday. Um, I'm Penny Owens with Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. I'm joined here on camera with um, by Ken Falstrom, our presenter today. We also have a uh, fellow coworker, Channel Keeper Communications Manager, Laura Sanchez on with us, helping with background logistics today. We're gonna give folks a few minutes to settle in here. We've got a few more registrants waiting to join us and then we'll get started. So thanks again, everybody for joining us today. Alrighty, while we're waiting for folks to kind of settle in and a few more folks to join us, just kind of go over some basic housekeeping for today's presentation. Uh, just so all of you guests know, joining us, all these attendees, um, the program is set up just to have everybody automatically on mute. Um, however, if you do have questions, you'll see on the panel on your right side, there's a questions box. And what you can do is you can ask a question at any time, go ahead and type in your question. And um, we'll be seeing those as the presentation's going on, and we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. But please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we'll address those at the end. Ken, did you just stop sharing your screen, I think? Apparently. <laughs> okay. Well, don't forget to share it again in just a second. Um, as many of you probably know, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, we're a local nonprofit environmental group. We work on the water and in the community to monitor water quality, advocate for clean water, enforce environmental laws, and also to educate and engage the community to join us in our clean water work to protect and restore the Santa Barbara Channel. This year, we're celebrating 20 years of keeping watch for clean water here along the coast. And as we all know, we're here today to learn a little bit more about how the health of our watersheds, our creeks, our rivers, our beaches and ocean are inextricably linked to our actions on land, whether in our gardens, our landscape, and in our communities. So now we'd like to launch a quick little poll to gauge our audience's familiarity with pesticide management. Ranging from, I have a lot of experience, I have some experience, and I'm not even sure what an aphid is. We'll go ahead and give you guys another few seconds here to kind of click your general category. And then we'll close up our poll. And it looks like we have the bulk of our crowd today, about 76% have some experience. We have some experts with us, which is exciting. And then we have some newbies too, who are just learning about some of our basic pests that we deal with. Great. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Ken Falstrom. He's a founding member oh, sorry, of Channel Keepers Board. He was raised in, uh, was born in San Luis Obispo, is a fourth generation Californian. He became certified through the UC Master Gardener Program here in Santa Barbara in 2008 and has served on various leadership um, capacities, including um, the lead of its project steering committee, the Garden Projects Workgroup, and as a member of its advisory board. And in Ken's words, he has planted and maintained a vegetable garden and home landscape each year since he was about 12, save for just a few years in college. So quite a lot of experience. He's a retired attorney and a member of the State Bar of California. He has also served in many, um, many numerous other boards and nonprofits in the area in leadership roles on the Hope School District Board of Trustees as president and long-term board member of EDC Environmental Defense Center, which Channel Keeper was born from, uh, the Los Padres Interpretive Association, and as a board member of a number of nonprofits, other nonprofits in the area, including the Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network, Retired Senior Volunteer Program, Santa Barbara Chapter of ACLU, Legal Defense Fund, 
and the summer solstice celebration. So Ken, thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation. We'll hand it over to you. Great, uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, this talk is, uh, I believe, in, in accord with the mission of both Channel Keeper, which is largely about educating citizens for about clean water, and also the Master Santa Barbara Master Gardener Program, which is part of the University of California. Its uh, purpose is to enhance the quality of life and economic well-being of citizens in California through research and education. I thought these two dovetailed, and so it's a joint presentation of both these groups. I have had vegetable gardens every year, save a couple when I was in college. Um, and they've had landscapes for many years myself. This talk is about non-structural management practices. I have in mind uh, doing one on structural management practices, which would deal with uh, things like what's, uh, runoff, dry wells, rain collecting, and other structural kinds of activities. This is about principally how to deal with land in a friendly fashion with respect to water. You know, we live in a, uh, a world that's changed the landscape. This isn't the way it is in uh, Santa Barbara, in this, as depicted here, but there are lots of places like this. And clearly, development like this has impact on water. When we're thinking about our impact on water and watersheds, we have to, at least I do, have to be aware of what I call the danger of private personal echo piety. We think that every little bit helps. But if you think that recycling a paper cup satisfies your uh, environmental obligations, please think about that again. We have to be aware of our actions at scale to avoid having single act bias and thinking that we're doing what counts. There are many things to do. So I don't consider myself a water hero, but I do think that I've got to work with others to try to improve the water situation. So there are a number of pollutants in uh, urban landscapes. And these, uh, this is a list of some of the sources of them. Uh, pathogens are largely human and animal excrement. I'm not going to be talking about them. I'm not going to be talking about brake residues. Trash is always an issue. Um, today we're going to talk principally about fertilizer and pesticides, mainly pesticides. Just, it's true of trash and it's also true of pesticides. It's a little easier to demonstrate with respect to trash. And the, uh, the concept that this slide shows is just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it isn't there and it isn't having an impact. So with a uh, large plastic, it's pretty obvious. With small plastic, it's not nearly so obvious. There are lots of plastics. Similarly with, with chemicals, you can't see the chemicals, but that doesn't mean that they aren't there. So the impacts of pollutants on water security has to do with these four items. Uh, that should be fairly obvious. If it isn't, I'm not paying attention. We need to protect water because it's so important in everything that we do. Now, conventional landscaping has impacts on water quality and that come from several forms. The first is an increase in uh, impervious surfaces causes uh, water flows and things run off. Disturbed and paved soils do the same. And we have an increased use of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides to maintain aesthetic value in our landscapes. When we use these, 
we need to recall that chemicals are mobilized by rain and irrigation and have effects on watersheds. Key term that I'm going to be using today is uh, integrated pest management. These are strategies to prevent and, and uh, suppress pest problems. There's all kinds of pests, as you're probably or may be aware. These principles apply to not only uh, in pesticides, they also apply to uh, herbicides and other chemical inputs. They're applicable in urban, suburban, and rural areas. Uh, I'm going to talk today about suburban and urban areas, mainly urban. So if you notice the bottom left slide, for those of you who don't know what an aphid looks like, the bottom left picture depicts a ladybug. And the little green things that you see are aphids. One of the ideas of integrated pest management is we want to use, to the extent that we can, beneficial insects, which help control uh, pests that we don't want. Nature has a balance, and we try to we want to find a, try to find a way to work with that. The one on the bottom right is the noxious snail, and the one in the middle is a, a pheromone trap. So if we use integrated pest management techniques and think about it in an integrated kind of a way, what we try to do is select methods that we're going to employ that are based on their effectiveness and having the fewest adverse effects on water quality. What's called responsible pest control means that we ask certain questions. Among them are, what is it? And is it really bugging me? Collaterally, we think, what can I really tolerate? How do I get rid of it? When did it come? What can I keep it from coming back? Integrated pest management takes these questions and puts them in a slightly different context using these five ideas. So with respect to any pest that we think is a problem, it's valuable to go through these steps. Identification is, of course, the first of them. You can take chemicals and you can spray them and you can kill everything. But for most things, and different pesticides will have different <clears throat> impacts on different kinds of creatures. So integrated pest management has an approach where we look at Four things. After identification, this is th these things are probably the most important things to do. Cultural factors are things like when we plant things, when we rotate, plant other things, how we prune, what, what kind of a diverse number of plants or types of plants do we use or have in our yards or gardens. And what do those plants need? These are cultural practices they do with plant health. There are also physical interventions like barriers, traps, tillage. A lot of with a lot of insects, they uh, they go through several phases of development. And if we interrupt one of those phases, by example, tillage, by stirring the ground or blocking uh, a phase of insect development, we can minimize their impact. There are also biological remedies. These include uh, trying to encourage beneficial predators. If you ever see uh, fast moving insects, they're likely predators. A lot of the uh, pests that we have in our yards and gardens are sucking insects. They move very slowly, scales, for example, or aphids. They're not fast moving. But if you see little fast moving insects, there's a good chance that those are going to be predators and they're going to live on and consume problem 
pests. There are also chemicals that we can apply. Chemicals are very effective at killing either specific or a broad range of pests. And then integrated pest management, because they are external deadly forces, we tend to try to use chemical uh, fixes for pest management as a last resort. So when we employ these, the first and second thing that we do when, when we're trying to responsibly control pests is we monitor and assess the problem. This is gonna involve identifying to the extent that we can what the pest actually is. And then we determine whether or not we need to do anything about it. In other words, is the kind of damage or the amount of damage that's being done by a pest tolerable? For example, leaf miners, if you see on the bottom right slide, a leaf, leaf miner, there are numerous species of leaf miners, including moths, flies, and some beetles. As a general rule, what you want to, what we want to do with uh, pests is we want to have them accessible by predators. So with these, the leaf miner, if we, we can use row covers, for example, to keep insects from landing on the plant. The, the leaf miner here is on a tomato plant. Leaf miners have a tendency to actually not harm the plant, they harm the leaf or the leaf. So a small egg at the, where, the, where the path is very narrow, an egg was laid probably on the other side of the leaf there. And then as the uh, immature insect grew, it got bigger and it kept tunneling and tunneling and tunneling and as it got larger, it consumed more. Now, the leaf miners, all they, they, they were an appearance problem generally. That's their main problem. We can control that by obviously, if you remove the leaf and dispose of it away from the plant, it will help prevent next year's insect from returning. We can use uh, blue and yellow sticky cards to catch them. That's also good in monitoring because if you, a lot of insects are attracted to blue and yellow. And if you have a sticky card and you put it in the yard, it will trap insects. That way you will know where they, they are there and you will uh, be able to at least catch some of them. Sometimes with leaf miners, if we uh, cover, if we put mulches down, plastic mulches, where if we disturb the ground, what happens is the after the insect goes through its maturity phase, it'll drop to the ground and then it will live in the ground so we can uh, interrupt its development process by disturbing the eggs while they're in the ground. There are some there are some uh, uh, biological products. One, one is called uh, uh, BT. And another is uh, neem oil. These disrupt growth and development of pesticide insects. And that they're non-toxic to honeybees and other beneficials. Fast acting botanical insects. We don't have to use them. And we try to do other things, cultural, physical, before using them. And we use those because they have fewer harmful effects and they break down quickly in the environment. The other picture is, uh, shows a slug at the bottom left. A hand lens is a good idea. You see one in the uh, upper left photograph. If you look at an insect, you can frequently, especially if it's like 40 power or so, you can identify mouth parts. You can tell what kind of insect it is. You don't have to know exactly what insect it is, but you can 
tell the type of insect that it is without great difficulty. But with slugs, uh, an approach, a cultural approach is to is to put your uh, plantings in the sunniest spot possible and you remove objects, plants, and ground cover that serve as uh, shady shelter. You can reduce moist surfaces by switching to drip irrigation or only running sprinklers in the morning. Some people use copper barriers. I found them to be expensive. And but if you if you would bury a four inch wide band of copper and bend over the top around the edge of a raised bed, it would prevent snails from crossing it. Some plants are snail proof, like impatience, geraniums, lantana, nasturtiums, and other plants with stiff leaves and scented foliage, like rosemary, sage, and lavender. These are not these are not snail friendly plants. So with snails, you can you can uh, regularly move them. You can build a trap. You take a couple of boards, slot an inch off the ground, and the the uh, pet the uh, snails will collect under the board, and you can uh, scrape them off and destroy them. Pesticide baits are, aren't too effective unless you also remove shelter, food, and moisture. Iron phosphate is safe around dogs, children. There's a methaldehyde, which is quite poisonous to dogs and birds, and then it loses its effectiveness rapidly in sunlight and in sunlight and after rain and irrigation. You want to, if you're going to use some sort of a bait, you want to apply it in the evening on warm days when they're active. We don't, we scatter it, we don't pile it. So analyzing what the pest is and is the first step in doing integrated pest management. Now, if we try all these other approaches and we are not having much luck, as sometimes happens, then there are chemicals, chemical approaches we can use. When looking at a chemical, we try to find the least toxic chemical that will be effective, that will have a, a low chronic water and animal toxicity that degrades rapidly, that kills a narrow range of target pests, and that has little or no impact on non-target organisms. There are various types of less toxic. I'm gonna to call them some less toxic and some more toxic. Here you see examples of uh, the sticky cards and of a pheromone trap. These attract non-desirable insects. There are also insect growth regulators that you can use that interfere with the development stages of insects. Here's what we're all familiar with the mosquito. And there are, uh, I, I've used <laughs> DEET and other things. So we know that these do repel. There are a number of things that repel insects, among them BT. There are dust, dust that we can apply to plants. These essentially cause the insect to dry up and die. There are numerous soaps and oils. These uh, coat the, the uh, body of the insect and essentially suffocate it. And there are botanical pesticides like BT. I wanted to say a word about uh, BT. BT is a bacillus thungenesis. My pronunciation may not be too good because I really haven't heard the last word pronounced. They always say BT. So these are naturally occurring bacteria. The application of them is crucial. Uh, for example, with corn, if you take uh, BT and you put it on the corn silk when they first appear, you will discourage insects from laying their eggs on the corn. If you put it on after the insects have laid their eggs, they won't interfere with the insect because the insect has to eat it 
and then it has uh, gastric consequences for the insect. It degrades in sunlight, and it's fairly specific as to <clears throat> what insects it affects. There are several strains. There's one, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the mosquito balls that people put in standing water. Uh, these are, it's, uh, there are different serotypes of uh, BT. There's one for mosquitoes. There's one for worms. Kirstaki is the is the uh, one for worms. So botanical pesticides can be very helpful. All they do is they the uh, the insect ingests the bacteria and it works on its gut. I'm getting a little behind here. So there are ways to improve the effectiveness of less toxic pesticides. One is to remove food sources. Another is to not do excessive watering. It's a, if we're using some sort of chemical pesticide, it's good to rotate them. And we need to have sanitary practices in our home and yard. The bottom left, you'll see there's another, there's a ladybug larva that's about to eat some aphids. Over on the, pardon me, that's the bottom right. Over on the bottom left, these are tomatoes that got too much water. Honeydew producing insects like uh, aphids and white flies, if we can control these, we have a better chance of uh, not having to use uh, more toxic chemicals. For example, with uh, white flies, putting a little uh, worm worm casings at the bottom of the plant makes the plant less tasteful to the white fly and using uh, ant baits to control uh, ants will help reduce aphid populations because the ants protect the aphids and without them uh, other beneficial insects are able to regulate them. There are drawbacks to using less pesticides. These are those. They're not as drastic as more toxic pesticides. But is it worth a little effort to use less toxic pesticides? Overusing chemicals like pesticides, herbicides, and others can, in effect, be like this fellow using a lawn spreader to apply his chemicals directly to the ocean. This happens through runoff, it happens through uh, chemicals entering the soil and getting into the water table. So the idea here is uh, we don't want runoff and we don't want to, to cause negative water effects, water quality effects in our indiscriminate use of chemicals. So there are several kinds of more toxic pesticides. There's organophosphates, pyrethroids, venoprazoles, and neonicotinoids. Now, the uh, when, when using any pesticide, including botanical pesticides, always read the label. If you don't know what it is, look it up. There's lots of cautions. They wouldn't put those cautions on there if they weren't required to. They wouldn't put the directions on the label if they weren't required to. So always follow directions when using any pesticide, toxic or not and always do the cautions as to timing, conditions of use, and any particular gear that you should wear to protect yourself. So of the organophosphates, uh, these three or two have been completely eliminated, and guess what? Detection in urban surface waters is declining since they don't sell them in res for residential use any longer. Most of them are uh, malathion products. So malathion has certain risks. I'm not gonna go into great detail on what these are, but they do, they're very toxic to uh, natural enemies, what we call beneficials. They're very toxic to honeybees. They're slightly toxic to uh, people. And they're, they're moderately to high tox, toxic. They do dissipate in a brief period of time.
well, pardon me, I skipped a slide here. The effect on, uh, this is how they enter, uh, malathion enters our body, but it does break down quickly. In rats, it's been shown to be gone from their bodies in a day. So there are also synthetic pyrethroids. Pyrethri pyrethrum is a uh, substance that is, was found in uh, chrysanthemum plants. It is toxic to honeybees, but the chemical industry has found a way to make these longer lasting and more durable. These are several types. If you look on a, uh, on a label, you'll see, you may see one of these listed. These are increasing in residential uses. These are broad spectrum insecticides. They kill any insect. These are the impacts generally of, of uh, the thanth. This is one of the uh, pyrethroids. It's a very toxic uh, to water quality. And it's very toxic to uh, natural enemies, beneficial insects. It's used for these kinds of uh, creatures. It's in a, a wide range of products. Um, these are some, some that you might know, some that you might not, but it's in a, a whole range of products. This is another of the pyrethroids. Um, and it's contained in these products. So when you read the label, you'll see what the substance contains. Now, in 1994, they came up with uh, neonicotinoids. These are basically uh, a, a kind of nicotine. There's been a lot of talk about them. Uh, their risks are the, based on the type. These uh, bind to the soil. So they've started, in some cases, uh, coating seed with them. The runoff issue is probably slight, and they are only slightly toxic to fish, although that depends on the fish species. Uh, they are very toxic to beneficial insects, very toxic to bees. Here's a list of some of them. There's, there's, uh, I think there's probably 400 of them now. Uh, there are impacts on farm workers, for example. Uh, it when used in when used in quantity. Uh, there's been there have been uh, dizziness, breathlessness, confusion, vomiting for farm workers that have been reported. Pet owners sometimes have skin irritation after they put flea control products on that have it emit a cloprid in them. Uh, dogs sometimes drool a lot after exposure. And if they swallow it, they may have trouble uh, walking, they get tremors. The half-life of of this product is uh, about 48 to 190 days, depending on the amount of ground cover. Persistence in the soil allows it to continue to be uptake, uh, uptaken by the plant. So the EPA is uh, considering regulation. One of the problems is that uh, when toxic effects are found, uh, the app, the uh, manufacturers uh, change the use, change the intended use, and they limit the use of the product on their recommendation. But the residues of this, these products uh, bind tightly with soil. It is broken down, but the pH and temperature of water affects the speed at which it breaks down, and it can get into groundwater in some circumstances. It's very, very toxic to honeybees and other beneficials, but it, the, the role they have, there's no science on what the uh, relationship to colony collapse disorder in bees is. Um, but it is, it, there is a lot of evidence that, uh, for example, lace, lace wings and ladybugs, if they eat uh, plants that grow in treated soil, they have reduced survival and reproduction rates. 
So when we're going to, when we're trying to control pests in our gardens, we try to answer these questions, and we don't, we don't blindly spray to kill everything. Because sometimes when we do, we kill everything. It's one thing to kill something, but it's something else to kill everything. So responsible pest control and integrated pest management is about being specific in what we're trying to do and realizing the consequences of doing this or that. I wanted to say just a couple of words on uh, fertilizers. Uh, they have runoff issues as well. A fertilizer is any material, natural or synthetic, applied to a plant tissue to provide nutrients. The, the general uh, categories of fertilizers, they contain nitrogen, which is uh, essential for vegetative growth, phosphorus, which is uh, essential for flowering, potassium, which is uh, essential for root growth, and also helps plants use water and resist uh, resist illness, resist diseases, and it's good for overall growth. Manure and commercial fertilizers, when they enter the water, they can stimulate microcosm growth and reduce, result in a reduction of oxygen in surface water, which causes uh, aquatic species to suffocate. In addition, there's are, there is potential for algaes which grow from the food contained in the fertilizer to be toxic to humans and cause rashes, nausea, and respiratory problems. Nitrates, such as those contained in calcium nitrate and ammonium nitrates, high level of these can be toxic to livestock and humans. They're, they're not absor absorbed by the soil, so they can leach into groundwater. And they move freely through the, the uh, soil, soil profile so that nitrogen that isn't used can reach groundwater easily. So when using fertilizers, we want to be concerned not to do off-target applications. We want to consider when we put them on during plant growth. And we want to not use more than is necessary. In or organic fertilizers are derived from plant and animal sources. In organic fertilizers, sometimes called synthetic fertilizers, go through a manufacturing process, although many come from naturally occurring minerals. Inorganic fertilizers usually contain only a few nutrients, usually nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, sulfur, and sometimes micronutrients. These are readily available to plants. However, since they're lost from soil quickly, you may have to fertilize plants several times during a growing season unless you use a product that's formulated to be a slow release. Nit uh, some nutrients like nitrate are quickly available for uptake. And if you only need a certain amount of such as nitrogen that you, that you, that you want to green up and be quickly available, an inorganic fertilizer like ammonium nitrite, nitrate might be in order. Organic fertilizers have low, usually have lower concentrations of elements. And many of these have to be convert, converted into an inorganic form by soil bacteria and fungi before the plants can use them. So they're typically more slowly released, especially during cold weather. But they have advantages. They don't make the soil crust as, as inorganic fertilizers some do. They improve water movement in the soil and in time add structure to the soil. They feed beneficial microbes, making it easier for the soil to work the soil. They may cost more because they're less concentrated, but they're generally more long lasting and more beneficial to the soil generally. So I went to a, a, a nursery person in time and, and I asked what they thought of, oops, 
what they thought of Miracle Grow. And she said, Miracle Grow is like heroin for the soil. And I looked at her and I, I didn't get it. I didn't know what she meant. I understand it a little differently now because compost and manures and, comp and uh, mulch, they increase, increase the nutrient level in the soil underneath. And they release, uh, they, they release nutrients slowly through a process of mineralization. They rarely cause water quality problems. And I heard a flamenco song that I really liked the other day that had a line that said, a spectator never cares for the land as would an owner. So concluding on pests, identify the pests and determine whether or not you can tolerate the problems that the pest is causing. Assess non-chemical approaches and use pesticides only when non-chemical methods aren't effective and the pest levels are intolerable. And then try to find the toxic, the least toxic, most effective product. If you must use garden chemicals, follow the directions. Use protective equipment and don't water after applying chemicals unless the label tells you to. Don't let runoff go into storm drains. Avoid applying chemicals outdoors when rain is forecast or when it's windy. Don't put them on paved surfaces. When you, when you use and store them, always wear shoes, long sleeve shirt, pants, eye protection, and other equipment that's indicated on the label. Properly measure them. Keep your measuring tools separate. Never put on more product than the amount listed. Always keep them in the original container. Don't pour them down storm drains. If you can't use up your pesticides and fertilizers, consider giving them away. Sewage treatments are not designed to remove toxic chemicals from wastewater. Don't put them down a storm drain or a toilet. The only acceptable way to dispose of pesticides is to use them up according to their label or to take them to a hazardous waste dump. To find one, call that number, an 800 cleanup. So, the environment is not just the physical surroundings, but includes the other species which, with which it interacts. If you uh, want to identify a pest, if you uh, Google UCIPM, it will take you to this page on the left. If you click on home garden turf and landscape pests, it will take you to the, other, the superimposed page. And if you go there, you can look up particular insects, particular patterns, they will have pictures, they will talk about talk about cultural practices that you can engage in, they will talk about barriers, physical things you can do, they will talk about beneficials or, uh, or biological resources that you can employ, and they will talk about chemicals, their use and effects. This would be a list of, of uh, other resources. Oregon State, which is this uh, ORST, uh, it's a fabulous resource. If you go to uh, NPIC ORST EDU, they will have they have great information about pesticides, about fertilizers, about just about everything. There are, with respect to particular uh, repellents, soaps, and such, uh, these are additional resources that you might use. I think uh, that this is. This is available as a handout to this uh, presentation. Uh, I think you can probably download it without too much difficulty. It's uh, investigation, figuring out what it is, is most important. So we need to keep our water and watersheds healthy. Channel keepers involved in that, master gardeners are involved in that. And we encourage you to think about these things when maintaining and developing whatever landscape you may have. Thank you for watching. Um, this is my email address. If you have some question you want to present to me, feel free. 
I'll try to get back to you, uh, or you can contact the Master Gardeners or Channel Keeper at the places indicated. With that, I think I'll turn it uh, back over to Ms. Owens and uh, see if she has anything to say. Maybe All there'll right. be questions. Thanks so much, Ken, that was wonderful. And just so folks know that handout, it's a PDF file with all of those um, links um, that Ken provided, a great resource if you wanna learn a little bit more and dig a little bit deeper on pest identification and pesticide use and pest management. So it looks like, Ken, we, have a, we do have a couple of questions and um, we'll start with this first one. And it says, if a pesticide is approved by the EPA, does that mean that it's safe to use? Well, as I, as I said, the, with the neonicotinoids, the, uh, the city of Portland has banned the use of neonicotinoids in the city. Um, the EPA has its criteria for evaluating things. It's generally reliable. However, this, it's, the EPA is part of the government. Uh, the government has its is influenced in its own way by the participants in the government. This includes the insect repellent or elimination industry. So I always take what EPA says with a grain of salt. They are scientific. Uh, some say that their science is being impacted by uh, those that control the government in ways that some of us think aren't the best. So I'd say EPA is generally reliable. I, I will say that when they tell when they tell you that you need to wear protective equipment when applying pesticides, they are not putting that on there because uh, the industry told them that it wasn't required. The industry that made the chemical is required to put that warning on there. I think that's enough said on that. Great, thanks. So and they, are, they are scientific and reliable generally. Right, but I, I do, yeah. there's been a history of things being approved for use when we don't have necessarily as much scientific data as we'd like to have as far as their safety or their long lasting impacts in riparian environments and in water. And just as an interesting side note, our um, city of Santa Barbara Creeks Division is actually partnering with the UCSB lab, Trish Holden's lab, and they're looking at some of the um, impacts of low level of neonicotinoids in our local streams. So there's some interesting research on that particular pesticide happening right here in Santa Barbara. Uh, another fertilizer question for you, Ken. If I'm using organic fertilizer, does it matter how much I apply or is it simply not harmful because it's organic? Um, there aren't runoff issues generally with organic fertilizers, and they're very they're slow to take effect. So you can, of course, I mean, you can die of drinking too much water. So you can use too much fertilizer. The soils in the West in the United States are generally pretty rich. Uh, sometimes in the East Coast, the soils are much more depleted than they are here. But the soils in the United States in California at least, the soil in the western United States is fairly rich. Um, you don't have to use very much fertilizer. However, if you want things to green, to green up, uh, you can apply nitrogen and all plants benefit from having healthy root structures and will fruit better with, with uh, fertilizers. So fertilizers are, are fine. You, you can use, of course, you can use too much. This is you can use too much of anything. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, looks like we have a, a question from your pal, Fred, um, who's curious about how do you get rid of slugs and snails? Well, I have uh, personally, what I do is uh, at night, I get a six long foot pole and I walk around my yard with a flashlight and I look for them and I squish them. I know that's not too attractive, but uh, slugs, uh, there are some uh, iron sulfate, I think it is. There's a product that works pretty well. If you have a real terrible infestation, you can use that uh, 
metalda, uh, can't pronounce it, metalda tide. It breaks down fairly quickly, but it is toxic to, it's, it's pretty toxic and it's not good for pets. So if you don't have children and pets, it's uh, indicated more. It's very effective, but it doesn't last very long. The, the real trick about slugs and pests or slugs and snails is to uh, interrupt their environment by not providing them cover. That way, if you don't, if they don't have cover, then insects will, uh, or birds and other creatures will devour them. They are tasty to uh, birds. Um, and usually you can roll up a newspaper with a hole in the middle and put it out there and then they will crawl in there. I'm telling you, they will. <laughs> and you can stop it and not even have to use your fingers. But something elevated with shade underneath it, they'll, you'll find they congregate there. Some people put beer in uh, water and put little traps out. Um, with snails, if you know if their shell is broken, they don't, uh, they can't survive. Slugs are a, like a little, a little bit of a different creature. They're much, to me, they're harder. Well, this um, next question kind of leads into something I've personally done in an effort to try to decrease access of uh, snail and slug friends to some of my garden plants. And the question is, are there any negative consequences of using coffee grounds or ground eggshells in the garden? I don't think there are, although I do I do hear that you don't want to have more than 5% uh, coffee grounds, or maybe it's even lower than that. Too much coffee grounds is, is uh, I think, I believe they're pretty acidic and too much coffee ground is not, uh, will, will uh, mess with the pH of the ground. Uh, eggshells, they have calcium in them, which is, uh, when I plant tomatoes, I always put powdered milk in the hole before I plant the plant. It helps the immuno, the, uh, the immunity of the plant. Um, I don't think you can use too many eggshells, uh, although it's probably, for uh, appearance, it's probably best to break them up before putting them. I just put them on top of the ground and let them work themselves in. I love eggshells. Almost as almost as much as I like uh, worm castings. Worm right. castings are. If you want to use fertilizers, worm castings uh, uh, less than twenty percent by volume in the soil are uh, really they really make plants take off. And you could have collected worm castings yourself if you have your own little vermiculture worm composting bin. There's a lot of worm worm bins around, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, you can look on uh, the Master Gardener site and they'll show you how to build a worm a worm bin. They're not too hard to maintain, and all they eat is uh, your garden waste. I mean your uh, your uh, compost waste. But you do have to keep, you have to pay attention to keep them alive and healthy though. Personally, I've overfed mine and. Uh... I had to learn that balance there, but if great compost and I collected the runoff and made a compost tea to help fertilize my garden as well. So I think that's all the questions we had today. First, I want to just thank everyone for taking time to tune in today and listen to this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ken, for all your expertise and information that you've shared. Um, there will be a recording of this presentation available if anyone's interested or they want to share. It just takes this platform a little bit of time to process that recording, but Channel Keeper will um, make that available for folks if they're interested. So thank you, Ken, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Check out the um, these websites and resources provided, and feel free to get in touch with us at Channel Keeper if you're looking to get more involved with some of our water quality work. So thanks again. Happy, healthy watershed gardening to everybody. Take care. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.